Uh, this is a talk that I've given a few times uh, recently, and I don't know how long it would take. I cut it out from uh, like a talk that originally took uh, about 90 minutes. So let's see <laughs> what we get. Uh, <laughs> I only have 30 minutes now. Okay. Uh, so, but thinking about the computer scientist and legal scholar working into a bar, and this is the beginning of a joke because a lot should go wrong. They use the same words, but they have completely different meanings, and they use very different reasonings, and they have very, very different values and goals. And if we would ask Rebecca, she, she <laughs> should say it's and right. <laughs> and I would ask whether we can bridge this very different views uh, 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 of, of these guys. And I will focus on uh, questions related to privacy because this is my main interest and my main expertise. So what I'll talk about is part of an ongoing project. I've been, I spent some years at Harvard as a visiting until they had to kick me out, I guess. And um, our initial goal, uh, we, we had a big project on uh, using differential privacy for sharing research information. And we were worried whether differential privacy, whether we can actually make a claim that differential privacy actually conforms with legal privacy requirements because when you want to use differential privacy with real data, you have to be worried about that. And, but throughout the years, the goal has broadened. And currently, we're looking at questions like how do we bridge or how do we relate conceptions of privacy in, in the legal literature and in the technical literature? How do we do that? Okay, so that hopefully that uh, computer scientist and, and, and lawyer, when they go into the bar, they will have something to talk about and which would be rigorous and meaningful and so on. So in this talk, I'm going to uh, very quickly talk about some uh, technical legal approaches to privacy. Uh, I'm not a legal person, so please don't ask me hard legal questions. I will not know the answers. Uh, and this is why it's very, very important for me to do this in collaboration with real legal scholars. Uh, I'll describe some of the gaps with the legal and, and, and technical approaches. Uh, that deserves by itself a whole uh, uh, talk, but I'll go over it very quickly. And then I'll describe some of our uh, past and current trials to bridge these gaps. And please stop me with questions if you have, or we can have a discussion uh, uh, during the presentation. So very briefly, we will talk about the problem of data privacy. We use data everywhere. We want to analyze it and, and, and get some good outcomes, whatever you like to do. And the privacy question is given a data set with sensitive personal information, how do we do something useful for it, with it? How do we compute and release functions of the data set while protecting individual privacy? Okay, and this is not well defined by itself. And the first question you should ask is what does this mean? What does protecting individual privacy mean? And here I want to bring in the two approaches uh, from a theoretical computer science approach. We would have Approaches, uh, we, uh, our, our approach will be rooted in complexity theory, in cryptography, in other areas of uh, theoretical computer science. We would adv advocate generality and we would advocate mathematical rigor as two very important values to pursue here. And differential privacy that <coughs> Anand is not here anymore, that Anand presented in his slides is a definition of privacy, it does not capture every privacy phenomena, but it does capture a significant part of privacy questions. It's a de definition and it expresses a desiderata of an analysis. It's what in words we want to say that any information related risk to a person should not change significantly whether that person's information is or is not being used in the analysis. And this is something that we can translate into mathematical uh, definition like this. This is the definition that Anand presented and I'm not going to go over it. The talk is not about differential privacy necessarily, uh, but this is what we do. We try to make a concept and to formalize it. And once we formalize it, we have richness of theory, we have algorithms, we have systems, we have proofs, whatnot. 
If you look at the legal approach, it's going to be very rewarding, as you see on the right, and it would be specified in the collection of documents, regulations, and these regulations would vary in the level of specificity and accuracy, and sometimes they would not agree between themselves. Okay, and here are some examples that we have been looking at uh, in the last few years. Uh, FERPA deals with educational records, HIPAA. It's not only a privacy standard, but it also has a privacy standard in it. Title 13 deals with the US Census. And I think Latanya Sweeney counted about 2,000 of these regulations in the US. So it's a very complicated system, uh, even if uh, uh, there are replications with it, within it. And in the EU, we see an attempt to make this more general. Uh, there's the GDPR that uh, has been in effect since May. And um, as I said, th there would be some inconsistencies. There's some uncertainty. And this is natural when we, uh, something is written in natural language. You could interpret it in many ways. There would be always some uh, a, a different interpretation of the text and so on. But what we see when we look at these uh, standards is that there are some recurring concepts, including PII, the identification, signaling out that I will speak about uh, in a few minutes, inference, and so on, okay? And these are concepts that not necessarily have matching concepts in the, li in the technical literature. And it's important for us to understand what they mean or what they could mean or what they should mean in order to have this discussion uh, going. So these are very, very different approaches to uh, defining or to discussing privacy. And there is a question of whether we can bridge between these two approaches, okay? And I think it's very natural to say this is an impossible task, and I may I agree with that, but I think that even if it's an impossible task, it's important for us to try to do that because there would benefits both for us technologists uh, we would understand what is expected in these standards. We would understand how what we do interacts with normative uh, expectations of privacy. And it would be also useful for the uh, legal scholars to understand whether what they expect, what they require is doable, whether it matches the current understanding, the current scientific understanding of privacy and so on. So I hope it's gonna be a, a, a beneficial interaction. Let me, before I go into uh, describing some of our work, uh, mention um, some related work that is out there. And I think, interestingly, Helen Nissenbaum, uh, when she presented this framework of contextual integrity, this was really a pioneering combination of technical and normative concepts in a single framework. There's still a lot of work to be done there in order to flesh out these concepts, but it's really interesting that she managed to put them together in a meaningful way. Technically, she's talking about information flows, but then she also talks about contexts that are a, a way to express uh, the, the normative uh, expectations or requirements. Um, some work that we've been doing, th this was at Harvard, is, uh, as I mentioned, this first goal to make a claim that differential privacy uh, satisfies a legal standard. We looked at FERPA and uh, we examined this standard. It governs the disclosure of personal information containing educational records. And we found out that if you look at the statute and the guidance documents, then they give a lot of hints, a lot of clues as to who is the privacy attacker and what is the goal of this privacy attacker. And this was a point for us to start uh, uh, and extract a mathematical definition of privacy from FERPA, okay? And we thought that once we will have such a definition, then we would make a claim about differential privacy. We would prove that differential privacy satisfies this re 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 requirement. And that is going to be a very strong argument in favor of the claim that differential privacy satisfies FERPA's uh, uh, requirements. So this appeared recently in the paper 
uh, and with all the detailed analysis there, there were some challenges there. For instance, how do you deal with the inherent ambiguity that is in the law? It's a question. And we brought up ideas from computer science in order to deal with that. For instance, we said, oh, there's already an adversary in this definition. Maybe we could let the adversary make decisions about the ambiguities in order to strengthen this uh, requirement. We may be just covering more ground and if we may, uh, uh, because this is going to be a, a, a definition that is harder to, to, to satisfy. If we make a claim that differential privacy satisfies that, then we're in a better uh, situation. So I'm not going to speak about that in detail. Uh, uh, but then uh, we were trying to apply this methodology. Like, as I said, we looked at all the legal documents that we could find and, 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 and dug for these clues on how to you know, draw the, the, the adversary. Can we, we thought it was a very general methodology. Can we apply it to other laws? And indeed, we were lucky to have uh, summer interns. So we just handed the paper the, to them and told them, oh, you should repeat it, the same experience with HIPAA. And this is what we got. And then say, oh, you should repeat the same experience with Title 13. And this is what we got. Interesting. Uh, wh what was the reason for that? The reason was that different laws are written in very different ways. And we were lucky that in HIPAA we had all these details that we could hold on to and define our attackers. And we could not find these details or I I in this statute. Okay, so this uh, drove us back to the drawing board to think of whether we can develop a different strategy to speak about this bridging between the legal and the, the technical conceptions of privacy. <coughs> so let me just show you uh, one example of this uh, direction. So eventually what we are tr trying to do now is because there are all these concepts that are recurring in different, uh, in different legal standards, uh, maybe we can look at each of these concepts separately and collect all the evidence of that we can have from the legal standards about these concepts and use that in order to develop uh, an understanding of what are the expectations from the legal point of view and compare that with our technical in understanding of these concepts. As I said, PII is a very interesting concept, but we don't know how to really model it rigorously. Uh, the, the, the when, when the law speaks about inference, a very important concept, we don't know exactly how to, to model that, and so on and so forth. And the concept that we uh, started with is singling out. Signaling out is a concept that appears in the GDPR. So in Article 1 of the GDPR, they say this regulation lays down rules relating to the protection of natural persons with regard to the processing of personal data. Okay? So if what you are processing is personal data, then there are all these rules in the GDPR that uh, control what you should do with, with the information, how you should protect it. You can accept yourself from having to do that if what you're processing is not personal data, okay? But then you would ask, what does personal data mean? And in Article 4 of the GDPR, they say, personal data means any information related to an identified or identifiable natural person, or uh, an identifiable natural person is one who can be identified directly or indirectly, okay? I mean, there, maybe this is a useful definition, but only to an extent. Yeah. <laughs> um, but luckily, we have some more evidence. Uh, so we can still ask, what does identifiable mean here? We know that personal data is related to being identifiable. And in Article, in Resolve 26 of the GDPR, we have an explanation which says to determine whether a natural person is identifiable, account should be taken of all means reasonably likely to be used, such as singling out 
to identify the natural person directly or indirectly. Okay? So we understand that there are maybe several means of uh, identifying uh, persons. Singling out is one of them, and actually it's the only one that is explicitly appearing in the GDPR as an example. Um, and, but if you can single out a person, then this means that this person was identified. This means that you have personal data. Okay? Now, you could ask what the singling out means. <laughs> okay? uh, because we in this train, and unfortunately, singling out appears only once in the GDPR. So we don't have a definition for that in the GDPR itself. Uh, but luckily, we have other documents. So the data protection directive that preceded the GDPR, they had a working party that explained a lot of the technical terms they are relating to, to privacy. This is the Article 29 working party. And they have a collection of documents with this explanation. And in one of the documents, they write, as regards indirectly identified or identifiable persons, this category typically relates to the phenomenon of unique combinations, whether small or large in size. A name may itself not be necessary in all cases to identify an individual. This may happen when other identifiers are used to single someone out. So from this, we can understand a little more that singling out is about unique combinations. You don't really need to have someone's uh, name, but a, an alternative way to identify a person uh, is also uh, a way to single him out. Yep. Uh, just so I can know for another vocabulary, at the Census Bureau, we call that disclosure by subtraction. Disclosure by subtraction. Okay. I guess because it relates to differencing attacks. Yeah. Exactly. And interestingly, this working party also uh, reviewed some technologies uh, with respect to singling out and other uh, threats like linkability and inference. And they asked themselves whether these different technologies uh, protect against single out. So in particular, this left-hand side of the, of the table is going to be uh, useful for us. And you could say, oh, how this sounds a little strange to me, and I'll get back to this, I promise. And another source that was useful for us at the beginning of this work is a paper by Paul Francis and others where they uh, presented the system, external defects that we also managed to attack. Uh, but uh, for this talk, uh, it was useful to read that they defined signaling out as occurring when an analyst correctly makes a statement of the form, there is exactly one user that has these attributes. Yep. Okay, so why would simply saying that there is exactly one user constitute singling out? Doesn't singling out intuitively mean that you know which one user? Has Not necessarily, that? because si once you have single out a user. In many cases, this is a stepping stone to the second stage of an attack where you use that information, connect it with some other data, and then maybe you uh, can identify the person. Right, but the, okay, so, oh, I see. So yeah. identification is what intuitively means yeah. somehow answering the question, which person is this? Yeah. Or which people yeah. are this? Yeah. And singling out is a step along the way to identify. That's my guess to yeah, why that, they that's have. That's quite unfortunate. I, I, uh, <laughs> I would not have uh, guessed for everything you've said so far that singling out did not actually involve. Identifying the person? A, sing a single person, yes. No, no, singling out means a single person in the data set. Yeah. That is going to be our our interpretation. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm really curious in real life, how can you uh, exhibit such a case non-constructively? So how, how is it possible the existence uh, in uh, other parts of mathematical science is shown by uh, enumeration arguments, but I'm not, I'm, 
I'm not sure I understand. No, that you can prove yeah. that there exists a unique something, yeah. but not actually identify what Pro that something Pro is. Proving real life that exists a unique person, of, but I cannot see the name. Sure, you could say that uh, if you have some like gene genetic. Uh, let, let me give you an example in the in you the next slide. A yeah. person with well, whose genetics this is, but you may not know who yeah. it is. So here, here's an example, like this is three lines from a, a fictitious Netflix price data, uh, <laughs> um, <coughs> where uh, note that there's exactly one row in the underlying data set that uh, contains the sting as a movie, and there is exactly one row of a person who watched Mulan between February 19th and March 10th, okay? And there's exactly one row in the data set that does not satisfy any of one or two. And in all these three ones, I would say, are singling out a person, or at least isolating a person in this data set, okay? How much time do I still have? Okay, 10 to, to something, I say, okay. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, we, what we, I, I want to go over now is our trial to define singling out. And interestingly, we also had uh, like uh, conversations with people from, from Europe who, who are in organizations that are relevant uh, to, to verify some of our views here. So here's a try to define signaling out. Let's assume for simplicity that our data set is obtained from some distribution and this, that is taken IAD from this underlying distribution. This is a big assumption, I know, but this is what we know how to do now. And then we take that data set, the sample from the distribution, we put into a mechanism, I'll call it an anonymization mechanism, and this thing publishes data, okay? And uh, the adversary gets to see this data, or more generally, maybe it can interact with the anonymization mechanism, and the outcome of the adversary is going to be a predicate, okay? A description of a possible row in the data set, okay? And the adversary will succeed if exactly one row in the data set matches this description, okay? So here's the first definitional attempt. M is secure against signaling out. If no adversary can isolate a row except with negligible probability over the choice of X and the kind of the mechanisms here, M and A, okay? And that would look like a very reasonable starting point for a definition except that this is impossible to attain. And it's very, the argument that this is impossible to attain is very simple. Think about a trivial adversary that does not get to see anything about the data set. Okay? So suppose I give you this task. Can you isolate a person in this, in this data set? And if you can choose a predicate that matches random roughly one over n fraction of the, uh, of the population, then a simple calculation shows, sorry, let's see the calculation first. Simple calculation shows that you manage to single out a person with 37% success, okay? And actually, it turns out that you don't need to know the underlying distribution even to choose this because using ideas from randomness uh, extraction, we can generate that predicate assuming that there is enough I mean entropy in, in the underlying distribution, okay? so. Trivially, I can isolate with 37% success. If there's a way for me to, che to check whether I manage to isolate, then I can get it up to almost 100% very easily. So this is bad. I can always single out even without seeing um, uh, anything about the data set. So what can we do? Um, we could say, okay, we recognize that this, this is there's this high probability of managing to uh, single out, but let's take that as a baseline and say no adversary should be able to single out with a significantly higher uh, probability. But I would say that this is somewhat unsatisfying because first it allows singling out with quite a high uh, probability, definitely not negligible as we hoped initially. And as I said, like if there is a way to check whether you succeeded in singling out, then this is virtually 100%, okay? So, we introduced the notion of uh, baseline. Let's define the weight of a predicate in the most natural way. 
what is the probability that if we pick an element from the underlying distribution, it satisfies the predicate. And then we can define the baseline as the probability that such a predicate, a predicate of weight y and w, would single out. And this tends to be the expression for the baseline. Okay. Uh, putting this in the table, we can see that if the baseline, if the weight of the predicate is roughly 1 over n or constant over n, then the baseline looks like uh, a constant. Okay. Uh, if it's 1 over polynomial, the baseline is also one uh, like 1 over polynomial. If the, base, if the weight is negligible, the baseline is negligible. And similarly, on the other side, if we look at the heavier uh, uh, predicates, uh, if, if the weight of the predicate is uh, omega of log n over n, then we get that the baseline is negligible. So what we say is this middle point is not really interesting. This is where we, we had the, the adversary that manages with high success probability to, to, uh, to um, single out a person, even if uh, the adversary did not get any uh, access to the data. But these are interesting points. If the baseline is negligible, we would then require that also given the outcome of the anonymization mechanism, the, the singling out probability is also negligible. Okay? So this lets us uh, to define, this is a simplified version of the definition. We, we can say that the mechanism is secure against singling out if no adversary can with non-negligible probability output predicate P such that P indeed isolates a person in the data set but it also has weight <laughs> bounded away from one over N so that the baseline is negligible. Okay, so with that, with having now a definition, we can return to the question um, whether uh, existing technologies protect against, protect against uh, uh, singling out. So remember this table. And about differential privacy, they ask, is, it, is singling out still a risk? And they're not sure. They say may not. About anonymity. They say, oh, differently, it's not a risk with anonymity. Okay. Um, what we can prove is the following theorem: that differential privacy actually protects against singling out in our definition. And interestingly, we gener uh, we create connections to uh, a recent line in research of differential privacy, the generalization properties of differential privacy, and we connect between this co concept of singling out and generalization. And we can also look at anonymity. So, oh, no, we disagree. And actually, this, the, this understanding shows that anonymity actually helps an adversary make most of the way towards single, uh, singling out a person. And then if there is a little mean, mean entropy in the data set, then the adversary can just use, like combine anonymity with a trivial ad adversary and, and signal out very easily. So anonymity actually uh, uh, does not protect against uh, uh, with respect to our definition. So let me conclude a few more minutes. Um, so we are trying to uh, create these new paradigms for matching technical legal definitions of privacy and similar fairness and other things. Uh, our modus of attempts in this group were uh, the work on FERPA, which was a mathematical legal formal claim that differential privacy satisfies uh, FERPA, the requirements, the modeling of singling out. We have a write-up in the going, but if you're interested, we can uh, share it with you, uh, at least the initial uh, uh, a version of the, this thing. Uh, I think this doesn't have to be a joke. Like we should be find way, uh, sh we should find ways to communicate with the lawyers and vice versa, and it's going to be very useful for us. And I don't know what Rebecca would say, but I projected this. <laughs> and <laughs> let me just one last last uh, slide. Um, so actually, I said the, the the original title of my slide was this joke, but this is what I want my title. <laughs> to be, 
I'd uh, love us to uh, discuss the complexity of privacy law, and the title is inspired by Salil's title for uh, the complexity of differential privacy. And there are several reasons for doing that. First, privacy law is really complex. There are many regulations and many privacy concepts, we, and we don't really understand them well enough, not yet. But the other reason is that I believe complexity theory, what we bring from theoretical computer science is going to be extremely useful here, okay? These tools that we, uh, we applied, I think, really very basic tools so far uh, from crypto and from randomness extraction and so on and probability. Um, but we have these essential analysis tools in theoretical computer, computer science and we should use them in, in order to dig more and more into this question. Um, and I think here I'll stop. Let me just uh, uh, give this slide with uh, my collaborators on this project and some references. Thank you. Yeah,